Um, I'm really delighted to be bringing sleep and circadian rhythms to the party because it's a beautiful example of the contributions of the behavioral and social sciences. And I'm glad to bring this literature to the fore here. Um, I want to begin my talk today with bipolar disorder, this very serious mental illness. And it turns out that the sleep piece is really prominent, prominent in terms of episodes and inadequate recovery. And so at a very simple level, I think we can think about the sleep disturbance. Ah, oh, wait a sec, I see what we're doing. Right, people have um, suffered in this way, so I'm gonna do what the previous speaker did. Um, and uh, flip back, right. So um, one of the, the big questions in the field of bipolar disorder as well as severe mental illness is to what extent the sleep piece is an epiphenomenon and to what extent it's contributing in some important mechanistic way. And certainly clinical researchers in the field for some time, including Dr. Weir, who was here at the NIH in the 70s and 80s, have encouraged us to think about uh, sleep and circadian rhythms in a mechanistic way. So let me tell you some of the evidence that has accrued. We've got longitudinal evidence showing that um, sleep disturbance is a common uh, early warning signal of episode onset. We also have daily diary studies where investigators have tracked sleep and mood on a daily basis for weeks or months and have shown that the two are tightly coupled. And there are just a few experimental sleep deprivation studies in the literature showing that people who are sleep deprived who have bipolar disorder are more likely to relapse into hypermania or mania. So perhaps we can think about a kind of simple vicious cycle model whereby sleep disturbance at night contributes to mood regulation difficulty in the day. And this sort of vicious cycle might contribute to some of the outcomes that we remain very concerned about in bipolar disorder. And then, of course, there's the opportunity that if we can generate an intervention to improve sleep, we might be able to cut into this vicious cycle and make a difference for these negative outcomes. And that's what I want to talk about this afternoon, uh, the treatment generation process that we've been engaged in. Now, in selecting what to present, I decided to bring along the findings that shifted our thinking and that changed what we were doing. So the, the ones that added to the complexity of the picture. The first finding comes from the Step BD study, which of course was funded by NIH. It's a big multi-site study. And June Gruber, when she was with us as a graduate student, she's now an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, looked at over 2,000 individuals diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And it was a surprise to us at the time that there was quite a bit of variability in sleep and wake times, around three hours per week. Week. Now consider that as someone who just flew from San Francisco over to the East Coast, um, several of us here did, today we're probably not feeling all that well, tomorrow's going to, that's going to be true the next day too, it takes time to adjust. And certainly Paulina Eidelman did show that in bipolar disorder, this variability in sleep is associated with important outcomes of the disorder. Another piece from the Step BD data set, looking cross-sectionally at the mood outcomes, if you look at normal sleepers and compare them to short sleepers, you can certainly see more depression and more elevation, not a surprise, we knew that. But here's what was a surprise to us. There were a lot of long sleepers, and uh, getting more sleep is not necessarily better. Uh, you can see more depression here. So this is just a cross-sectional slice, but it 
it triggered us to start to really understand and study long sleep or hypersomnia. And Kate Kaplan, when she was a graduate student with us, uh, uh, led this research and now she's a postdoc continuing this line at Stanford University. Now, there's no gold standard of hypersomnia. Um, so we had six indices that we used just to see what is happening in our inter-episode samples. And three of the six converged on a rate of about 25%. So that's a fair number of people with this long sleep pattern and picture. But another feature here that really surprised us was we had sleep diaries and actigraphy from this sample. We don't have PSG yet, Kate is collecting that. But we found that this is not so much a problem of too much total sleep time as the sleep literature would have us uh, believe, but this is more of a problem of too much time in bed. So that's an important clarification from a treatment development point of view. You, uh, because very different kinds of interventions uh, would match with uh, those two potential pictures. So we were insomnia researchers coming into this field and we just found a lot more complexity than we were bargaining for. This uh, overlap and comorbidity between insomnia and hypersomnia, we searched in the literature. There were actually some reports of this in the past and also um, the delayed sleep phase Piece, the going to bed late and waking up late, the owl-like tendencies, all part of the diagnostic mix. And so what do us clinical researchers do under conditions where we have this kind of complexity? It seems to me that there are at least two paths. Uh, one is we can pick the subgroup and study just people with bipolar disorder who have insomnia, or we can broaden out and study the complexity. So we decided to take this latter route um, in a small way for this first piece and later uh, right at the end I'll show you the larger way we're doing it now where we're recruiting people with bipolar disorder and insomnia but we're not excluding these other sleep problems. Now, it becomes interesting to me to reflect on what the complexities in the sleep picture, this variability in bed and wake time, this exposure to light and dark um, at the wrong times of the day, uh, long periods in bed, might be doing at the level of the biological clocks. We've got clocks in every cell and organ in the body. There's a central clock, the SCN, which controls the sleep-wake schedule and cycle and it's responsive to light and dark. So this dark room with no windows um, is very conducive to sleep and I won't be at all offended if any of you uh, nod off. But we've also got clocks in every cell and organ in the body. So what this means is that under the irregular schedules that people with bipolar disorder, and as I'll get to in a, just a moment, severe mental illness more generally, we've probably got double desynchronization, where there's desynchronization between the clocks internally and external time, and between all the different clocks within the body itself. So the orchestra of clocks is not working together well. And then I think it becomes interesting to think about what are the implications of this at the level of health and the burden that we see in bipolar disorder, particularly in terms of cardiovascular disease. And by Bipolar disorder aside, just for one moment, we know that chronic circadian misalignment from the basic sleep science literature has adverse impacts in major organ systems in the body. And indeed, shift work is one of the top 10 leading causes of cancer. Now, another piece at the level of biology, we know that human sleep is governed by two systems, 
process S and process C. And these systems are separable systems, but they interact as depicted here. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But what I do want to say is that in bipolar disorder and severe mental illness more broadly, we don't yet know which of these two systems is the major problem or how they interact to create the problems. But regardless, I think that we know some of the features of these systems that are relevant for intervention. And in particular, biology has endowed these systems to be preferentially modifiable to certain exogenous inputs. And if you scan your eyes down these exogenous inputs, you'll notice that these are readily alterable by changes in behavior. So these are modifiable inputs. So then as we're coming toward thinking about treatment development, we know some of the complexities, some I've shared with you. We know something about the biology and the need for synchrony for health. And we know some of the targets that we're going to be able to hit the biological sleep and circadian system uh, quite powerfully. So what we realized as we were coming to the point of working out what the intervention was going to be is that there are some evidence-based interventions in the field that have principles or components that we decided to combine in a new way. And so these are the different components, and I'm just going to hit very briefly on some of these. So CBTI, very, very briefly. Um, the recommendation here and the coaching here is to get the patient to only go to bed when sleepy, but most important is to help the person to get sleepy at the right time of the biological day. Important, awaken at the same time every morning. It's like the anchor around which the circadian rhythm can align. Um, napping discharges the homeostatic pressure to sleep and makes it very difficult to get to sleep and stay asleep. And then um, there's also the problem of maladaptive conditioning between the bed and not sleeping. And certainly we see many patients who have very unusual setups, some even uh, living their life from their bed with a fridge in reaching distance, uh, technology in reaching distance, distance. And I think sometimes we think as humans we're beyond um, uh, the biological, uh, the sort of Pavlovian conditioning. But let me uh, demonstrate that maybe we are not so much beyond. Let's see if I can get this to work. If not, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. It's not going to work for us. But let me tell you, this is on YouTube. It's, uh, if, you, if you Google up weird baby sleep, um, this little girl has somehow managed to learn to fall asleep with the water pouring on her. And she keeps waking up every time the water's turned off. It's very cute and funny. Um, and uh, we don't know her learning history. But uh, it is the point that we've got to be careful how what we associate the bed and the bedroom with. So why interpersonal social rhythm therapy? This is so interesting. The human circadian system ticks at about 24 uh, hours and 10 minutes. And that 10 minutes is very relevant. And fortunately, we, for most of us, can entrain back to the 24-hour clock pretty easily via the use of Zeitgeber's light being a key one. But both animal and human research shows we're surprisingly sensitive to meal times, social cues, exercise, temperature. So interpersonal social rhythm therapy came about because of evidence that patients with mood disorders and probably other serious mental illnesses as well, either don't have biological systems that are as sensitive to the Zeitgebers or don't have as regular Zeitgebers in the environment. But part of the intervention is to regularize these. So we took that principle.
We also took uh, some principles from the chronotherapy literature. This is a fascinating literature. It's a small literature. So the biology is very worked out um, in animals that the uh, retina, fast neural pathways through to the SCN, on through to the pineal gland, um, melatonin secreted by the pineal gland, and melatonin onset is inhibited by light and permitted by darkness. And it promotes sleepiness. So we really need to be in dim light conditions, much like this room, uh, for sleepiness uh, and then for sleep onset. And so the chronobiology literature has come out of, uh, of this biology. And here's one study conducted by a small Ital uh, an Italian group. It's a small pilot study where they trialed three nights of dark therapy, which was from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. on three consecutive nights. And they compared drug therapy alone versus drug therapy in extended darkness. And as you can see, there was a rapid decline in young mania rating scale scores for those who got the dark therapy. Interesting pilot study. Now, we're very much in the business of trying to develop interventions that are highly scalable and disseminable. So we didn't want to come up with something that involved anything like an inpatient stay or expensive light box equipment. But instead, what we did was include modules that would instill habits that we hope would last a lifetime of dim light exposure at night and bright light exposure in the morning. And that brings me to the motivational piece. Uh, really key, and I think um, many people can spend decades of careers studying this. I'm so fascinated by this. So this is a patient um, who participated in this study. I've checked in with you mentally every single day. I don't even like pushing my bedtime back till 12.30. It just doesn't feel good, not in terms of rest and not in terms of this habit energy I've developed around an 11.30 bedtime, I've truly developed some strong positive habits. And this is only an eight session intervention, but there's really that action tendency toward different sleep wake habits that can, as you'll see, make a difference. So remember what we're doing here is really a treatment experiment of this model, seeing if we're gonna cut into this vicious cycle and make a difference for these outcomes. So very briefly, um, a great team of people working on this with me. Everyone in the study had treatment as usual. One group got the new intervention, targeting exogenous inputs to the sleep and circadian rhythms, and one got a pretty strong control psychoeducation intervention. Primary outcome measure, you can see actually both groups improved, but the group who got the exogen the, the intervention targeting exogenous inputs to the sleep and circadian system improved more and the gains were maintained at follow-up. In terms of impairment, both groups improved and no significant difference this time. That chimes well with the data that we know that psychoeducation actually is very helpful for people with a severe mental illness. But the two groups look really different when we look at six month follow up relapse. In the red, you can see the group who got the new intervention compared with the blue, the psychoeducation intervention, lower rates of relapse. And similarly, fewer days spent in episodes. So this is very encouraging, I think, a very simple intervention, improving sleep and also symptoms of the comorbid mental disorder. I just showed you this data for bipolar disorder. We've just uh, had a publication um, where we did a similar thing with teenagers who had depression. And there are investigators around the world who are showing very similar findings. So that's one piece of convergence. Another piece of convergence is I've shown you just briefly, short talk today, that bipolar disorder is really characterized by this complexity. It's not just insomnia, it's all these other problems as well. And I could show you similar data for severe mental illness more broadly. So where to go now? I think 
I'm really paying attention to John Weiss's concern that we just have too many empirically supported treatments. There's, it's not going to help the field to keep developing CBTI for bipolar disorder or CBTI for whatever. What we've done is try to establish from all the studies that have been done an intervention devised from the basic science literature as well as informed by the treatment outcome literature that we hope will be helpful across severe mental illnesses and across the various sleep and circadian disturbances. And we will find out soon because um, we're about a, a short time away now from um, looking at the data of this intervention for youth and um, just starting off in this intervention for severe mental illness in adults. And there's a particular feature of this study I want to very briefly mention, um, and that is that this study is designed to try and do a better job of closing this really long gap that we see between the development of new interventions and, and really being able to get them out there in the community. And the way that we're doing that is conducting this in community mental health centers. And to do this, we've, we've been forming a Northern Californian network of CMHCs in this first study we're conducting in Alameda County Behavioral Health Care services. So I hope I've been able to convince you today that the sleep and circadian piece in, by, um, in mental illness is not epiphenomenal. And I hope I've been able to show you and convince you that we have been able to derive the simple, short, powerful, inexpensive interventions that could really have a big public health impact given their, the data on them improving functioning and also reducing the symptoms of the comorbid severe mental illness. Thank you very much.